So the nice thing about Venus is if there's a giant living civilization there, it'll be airborne, so you can just fly through and collect samples. Yeah. With Mars and uh, moons of uh, Saturn and Jupiter, you're gonna have to dig dig under to find the civilizations, the right. dead, dead or living. Right, and so yeah, maybe it's easier then for Venus because certainly you can imagine just a balloon floating through the atmosphere um, that, or a drone or something that would have the capability of just scooping up and sampling. Um, to, to dig under the surface of Mars is maybe feasible-ish with, you know, especially with something like Starship that could launch, you know, a huge digger basically to the surface and you could just excavate away at the surface. But for something like Europa, um, we really are still unclear about how thick the ice layer is, um, how you would melt through that huge um, thick layer to get to the ocean, and then potentially also discussions about contamination. The problem with looking for life in the solar system, which is different from looking for life with exoplanets, is that you always run the risk of, especially if you visit there, of introducing the life yourself. Right? It's very difficult to completely exterminate every single microbe and spore on the surface of your of your rover or the surface of your lander. And so there's always a risk of introducing something. I mean, to some extent, there is continuous exchange of material between these planets naturally on top of that as well. And now we're sort of accelerating that process to some degree. Um, and so if you dig into Europa's surface, which probably is completely pristine, it's very unlikely there has been much exchange with the outside world for, for its subsurface ocean, you are for the first time potentially introducing bacteria spores into that environment that may compete or may introduce spurious signatures for the life you're looking for. And so it's it's a, almost an ethical question as to how to proceed with looking for life on, on those subsurface oceans. And I don't think one we've really have a good resolution for at this point. Ethical. So you mean ethical in terms of concern for the like for preserving life elsewhere, not, right. like not to yeah. murder it, as, yeah. as opposed to a scientific one. I mean, so, we always <laughs> worry about a space virus, right, coming coming yeah. here or, or you know some kind of external source, and that we would be the source of that potential contamination or the other direction. Yeah, I mean, they that you know the whatever whatever survives in such harsh conditions might be pretty good at uh, surviving in all conditions. It might be a little bit more resilient and robust, so it might actually take a ride on us back home. Possibly, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure that some people would be concerned about that. I think we would. We would hopefully have some containment uh, procedures as if, if we did sample return. Or you mean you don't even really need a sample return these days? You can pretty much send it like a little micro laboratory to the the planet to deal with the experiments in you know in situ, and then just send them back to your planet the data. And so I don't think there's is necessary that especially for a case like that where you might have contamination concerns that you have to bring samples back. Um, Although probably if you brought back European sushi, it would probably sell for quite a bit with the billionaires in New York City. <laughs> so, <laughs> sushi, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would love from an engineering perspective just to see all the different candidates and designs for like the scooper for Venus and the scooper for Europa and and Mars. I haven't really looked deeply into how they actually, like the actual engineering of collecting the samples because that's the engineering of that is probably essential for not either destroying life or or uh, polluting it with our own microbes and so on. Mm -hmm. So that, that's like an inge interesting engineering challenge. I usually for rovers and stuff focus on the on the robot on the sort of the mobility aspect of it, on the mm -hmm. robotics, the perception, and the movement and the planning and the control. Mm -hmm. But there's probably the scooper is probably where the action is. The, yeah. the microscopic sample collection. So basically, you have to first clean your vehicle, make sure it doesn't have any earth-like things on it. And then you have to put it into some kind of thing that's perfectly sealed from the environment. So if we bring it back or we analyze it, it's not um, it's not going to bring anything else uh, external in. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it'd be, that'd be an interesting engineering design there. Yeah, I mean, Curiosity has been uh, leaving these little pods on the surface quite recently. There's some neat photos you can find online. And it's they kind of look like a uh, lightsaber hilts, which <laughs> so um, the yeah to me I, I think I tweeted something like uh, you know this weapon is your life like don't lose it curiosity yeah. because it's just dumping these little vials everywhere and it's yeah it is scooping up these things and the intention is that in the future um, there will be a sample return mission that will come and pick these up mm -hmm. um, but 
it's i mean the engineering behind those things is so impressive the thing that blows me away the most has been the landings um Especially, I'm trained to be a pilot at the moment, so that's the sort of, you know, watching landings has become like my pet hobby on YouTube at the moment and how not to do it, how to do it with different levels of uh, conditions and things. But with the, you know, when, when you think about landing on Mars, just the light travel time effect means that there's no possibility of a human controlling that descent. Mm -hmm. And so you have to put all of your faith and your trust in the computer code or the ai or whatever it is that you've put on board that thing to to make the correct descent um and so there's this famous uh period called seven minutes of hell where you're basically waiting for that light travel time to come back to know whether your vehicle successfully landed on the surface or not and during that period you know in your mind simultaneously that it is doing these multi-stages of um deploying its parachute deploying the crane activating its jets to come down and controlling its descent to the surface. Um, and then the crane has to fly away so it doesn't accidentally hit the rover. And so there's a series of uh, multi-stage points where any any of them go wrong, you know, the whole mission could, could go awry. Um, and so the fact that we are fairly consistently able to build these machines that can do this autonomously is to me one of the most impressive acts of engineering that NASA have achieved.